next on will be is uh, is Ken Parker with Food Is Our Medicine: Advancing Native Health and Culture. Good to see you again. So, so as Ken gets settled, um, you know, a, a comment re resonated with me about um, sometimes how we can be hard on our own people. And uh, an elder from my region says he goes, "We eat our own." And I think we can be the hardest on our own people. Like sometimes when you're leading in your own home region, um, you have to be like almost twice as good as somebody who's non-native or not from that area in order to really rise. And I think that's an area that we need to work on. And uh, as Faith shared earlier, you know, the, the challenge that many of us face is, you know, many of us are caught in that historical trauma um, reaction. And I think that's a really great way to look at it. But I think it's up to us to make a change for our next generation where we allow our own people to thrive in our communities and, and have successful projects that we support and that we develop trust for. So um, I've really been a fan of, of Ken's work. And uh, you know, I think there's amazing things going on in your community. And I'm really excited for you to share. So let's, let's give Ken a, a round of welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, I just want to let you know I'm not a health professional. Uh, actually, my background is in uh, nursery. Uh, I'm a plant guy. Um, I'm also a former U.S. Marine, so that just means uh, when I talk to the plants in the community garden, they listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is our fourth year with uh, the Food is Our Medicine Project. It is actually a collaboration between the Seneca Nation and Seneca Diabetes Foundation, and uh, it's an uh, innovative program to address the uh, well-being of our community, the health and well-being through culture and promoting our traditional food ways. I want to let you know this is a uh, Seneca Nation is down in uh, the western New York area. There's actually uh, four distinct areas. One is near Niagara Falls, a small portion of land in Buffalo, and the largest uh, of our territories located in Cattaraugus, just south of Buffalo, and down in the Allegheny, Salamanca area. Um, it has been a challenge for me to work with the Seneca community because uh, the tribe, the two uh, uh, territories are about 45 minutes apart, and it's a very distinct community. So some of the programs that we have developed over the four years have been successful in one, not successful in another. So we did other things. So um, I guess that's my, my military background where we just adapt. We just uh, adapt to that community, uh, what their needs are and what their strengths are, and uh, we do different things there. That's all. So it's, a, it's an approach, Food is Our Medicine is about uh, addressing everybody in the community, all the way from our youth, all the way to our elders. There were uh, three distinct uh, programs that we did, which is the Elder Sharing Circle. We did uh, youth garden initiatives. And then community gardens is to get people interested in growing their own food. And we talk about our traditional plants and our uh, native indigenous plants. And uh, I'm a big fan of the, the wild edibles. So our elder circle started, we actually met once a month um, at the uh, elder center, and the idea was to honor our elders. It's a family event, it's a potluck. Um, there were many arguments about healthy food choices. I have to be honest, and some of you already know this, working in the health field, that the elders, some of the elders are very stuck in their ways, and they don't like the healthy choices. So uh, we come from a culture where I'm at in the Buffalo, it's chicken wings. Our three sisters, sometimes they think our chicken wings, pizza, and uh, those kind of snacks and french fries. But we're changing that culture. And I think the idea of food is our medicine is to change behavior. Um, the elder circle is honoring. Uh, maybe we, we, uh, we meet in the circle. We talk about traditional food ways. We talk about how it was back then. You know, when we all used to sit at the kitchen table and eat together and when we used to can as a family, those kind of things. And what we wanted to do is engage the whole family to do uh, traditional knowledge and knowledge transfer. Uh, now our youth initiatives, we worked with uh, a couple schools in the territory. One is the Early Childhood Learning Center. I'm very fortunate that we did have some champions there, some of the teachers, which took charge of that. Um, and uh, what we did is uh, produce the plate in, in Allegheny, and then we did uh, raised bed gardens at the Cattaraugus Early Childhood Learning Center. Part of it, again, is to get the kids involved, get their hands in the soil. We don't say dirt, we say soil. Soil is a living entity. I always say dirt's at the dump. So uh, we work with the kids. They love getting in the garden. 
And also part of culture is to learn the Seneca language and use that as part of their gardening. And uh, to be able to go out there and grow something, pick it and bring it into the cafeteria and make a snack with it was uh, very interesting. Uh, these are posters from the classrooms, uh, also utilizing the Seneca language at the Early, Ch Early Childhood Learning Center. Uh, so it, uh, it was very successful, which uh, went back and, and started getting into the family life. And I guess in my experience, some of the challenges have been we can work with the kids, get them excited about vegetables, but when we send them home, we have to really change how the family is. So in retrospect, what I would, my advice to you, the challenge is, is that we need to work more on family and children together. We can do a produce to plate at the school, but we have to get families involved because we have to change the culture there first too. Um, our community garden is actually a demonstration. Uh, a lot of times, some of you may know this, that we don't have the greatest soil. Um, an easy way to do that is to create these raised uh, bed gardens and we bring in compost. I'm a firm believer in the, I like to call it black gold, uh, which is great. And uh, we can grow a variety of things at the uh, community garden. So to date, actually we've done uh, the upper top picture is our elders boxes so they don't have to bend over. Uh, my advice with those, I would make a slight modification for somebody in a wheelchair. That's what I've learned now. Uh, but those are great boxes. We actually stole a design off the internet. We have a local Amish community that helps us out and uh, they put them together for us. We have 35 raised garden beds uh, throughout the community and uh, we're well over 100 uh, individual family gardens now in our community, people growing and, and talking about organics and, and heirloom vegetables. So that's a very positive thing. Um, the, our community garden here, let me uh, try to advance to the slide here. Let's see what I'm doing. There we go, sorry. Uh, we met at the community center. Uh, it was a design by the community. And the way we cheated, we put those boxes, uh, which are made from larch. We use newspapers on the grass. You can use newspapers as a natural mulch. It breaks down. We used about three to four sheets thick, and then we put the compost on there, and we were successful. Our garden is in the design of the wampum. And uh, that's part of our, so again, we're always relating culture in there. Uh, I'm a big fan of permaculture, meaning that we grow vegetables uh, and flowers together. Uh, when you have diversity, you also have diversity and in beneficial uh, insects. Signage is very important, what I learned with the community gardens, that uh, volunteerism doesn't always work. I know some of you have done this. Uh, with our garden, you know, we had a pile of people there to help create the gardens, get it going. And then usually by the middle of the summer when it's time to weed, you know, you're, we're down to about three or four guys. And then when harvest, it seems like there's five times people, you know, that are there to collect the harvest, which is okay. That's a good thing. Um, what we did is we did the signage and what we did is assigned it to specific groups. So uh, as uh, the pictures, the photographs that you've seen before, we had the youth groups and uh, uh, one year I did departments. So there's a little bit of peer pressure, you know, you're like, you know, the, uh, the uh, um, DPW public works department's looking kind of weedy over there. You know, maybe you guys want to send somebody over. So, and I think peer pressure is a good way to do community gardens. Um, we were very fortunate and I wanted to acknowledge uh, First Nations Development Institute for our white corn grant. They have helped us uh, progress with what we're doing. Uh, right now, we are actually growing eight acres of white corn in our community on territory. Um, we have a local farmer that we've engaged with. And uh, so this has been ongoing uh, the last four years. The first year, we actually did it old school. We got a horse and plow and uh, we did our field. We struggled the first two years, I have to be honest. Uh, but this year, very successful, but we had a drought in Western New York. So I'm uh, keeping my fingers crossed on the harvest. So, but if I can get at least four to six acres, I'm very happy with that. Uh, along with uh, doing our heirloom, our traditional crops, very important that we do a lot of public outreach and we do all kinds of marketing events. Uh, if you wanna come down to Western New York, we're actually doing our, our harvest October 9th and a husking bee on the 10th down in the Western New York area. That's from last year when we were braiding our corn, getting ready to hang, to dry it so we can uh, process it and. Uh, the end product is we're working on three products. I know the Unitas, Onondagas are, uh, already have products on the go, uh, which is uh, white corn flour, roasted white corn flour, and the whole hulled white corn. And our idea is to get it in the hands of the general public. Um, I did a lot of work at Six Nations in Canada, in Southern Ontario. And I always remember if I was in a mood for some corn soup or cornbread, I could just go down to the convenience store and they always, somebody had a fresh batch of it. And uh, when I went to the Seneca Nation back in 2009, 
uh, not readily available, and that, that really bothered me. So our goal is to get our packaged product into the local stores, to the community. And also what we're working on is coming up with new recipes, new modern recipes for our white corn products. So, uh, which leads to, I'm gonna talk about a little bit later about, we do a, an event called the Indigenous Food, Indigenous Food Challenge, excuse me. <clears throat> Another interesting uh, idea that came, that fell in our laps, and this was successful in Salamanca. They have a, a, an old theater, and I was able to rent it out for eight weeks, and we did a uh, movie series, and these are all the Foodway documentary series. So the very first one, I'd like to start with the controversy, which is uh, The World According to Monsanto, and really what I want to do is engage the public and question about, uh, about our food, where it comes from, and the choices that we make about food. Farmageddon's on there. Uh, the thing with diabetes, uh, I was very impressed with the documentary called Fed Up about how sugar is really part of all the different foods. And even though these kids are trying hard, they really put sugar in everything, just about everything. So we need to work harder. Those, uh, the way I did it, I'm just going to share how I did this. I just went on Amazon and bought used ones. Uh, you can get them very cheap, the DVDs. Uh, we held a public event. We didn't charge for it. And we didn't serve popcorn. We actually served vegetables as a snack when you came into the theater. So um, we're a small community. And uh, I was uh, actually hopeful. I was thinking if I could just average 10 to 15 people, I would be happy, you know, uh, per showing. We actually averaged around 25 to 30 people at the theater. So I was very impressed. And we also engaged not only the native community, but also the local community in that area. And I think that's very important. Another initiative we started is our uh, farmer's market. I think that's a very important component of healthy lifestyle. Uh, we started four years ago. We struggled. I had five vendors when we first started, and we kind of moved around the territory. We found a great spot. That slide you've seen is uh, kind of near a major highway, and uh, now we actually average around uh, 45 vendors. Um, we are the largest market in the southern tier, but I say that with caution uh, because we are successful, but we've kind of gone away from our mission statement, which is uh, I want producers and artisans, you know, people who make things, organic products, and we have some vendors that I kind of, we're teetering on a flea market, which is sometimes okay, but really we are in a food desert, and I think we need to think about what a food desert is, and, and, and I think we've all illustrated here, you could have that grocery store, but it's the quality of the products that are in those grocery stores that are, are questionable. Um, in Western New York where we live, it's ironic that our territory is located in the heart of farm country. Brant County has a huge uh, uh, group of farmers, a co-op, but all their products go to the big grocery chains, and not much of it filters back to the, the territory of the locals. So we are able to engage some of the smaller local farmers where I can get them to come to the market. I actually have five farmers that come there. Uh, the other challenge at the farmer's market, I have to be honest, is uh, the food choices where we have food vendors. Um, I have a barbecue guy. There's a fried dough guy, which I'm not big on. And um, I th we also had the kettle corn guy, but I've been threatened by a lot of community members. If I get rid of him, I'm going to be gone. <laughs> so, so we do a little bit of compromising. But look, let's be honest. We have, I've asked, we've had the uh, lady do wraps, healthy wraps, and she's just not getting the business. You know, people want a burger. And so I need help here. I don't know how to fix that. Again, it's about behavior, that those people are still going to make those food choices. All I can do is keep offering healthy food choices at the farmer's market, but ultimately people come there and they're going to buy whatever they want. I don't know if that makes sense. So that's something that we all need to put our heads together and, and try to work on. We need to fix that. Uh, a great event that at, uh, we did at the uh, Seneca Farmer's Market was with the kids. I like to call it agri-literacy. I've seen a couple other speakers talking about the books, food books for the kids. Those are great. So we did a story called Who Grew My Soup? and uh, actually had the uh, president of the Seneca Nation he come down, uh, Maurice John, and yeah, he put those costumes, he read the story to the kids. Uh, for me, it was a defining moment. It was the best uh, of the project because here I had 200, there were 200 children plus volunteers plus parents. Uh, we gave them veggie bucks and they got to go buy vegetables and he read that story in the corn costume which i thought was awesome one of the kids went home and told his mom said yeah the, the uh, he read us a story the corn read us a story and the mom's like the corn what kind of corn and the little kid said the indian corn read the story <laughs> 
So there's our veggie bucks. We just put them together and we worked it out with the uh, farmer's market vendors and they made little $2 packets, packages and those kids went home with uh, vegetables and produce. And I thought that was great. And I love the t-shirts. I don't know if you, kept, you caught that, let us turn up the beat. So uh, we had a lot of fun with that. I would encourage you. Uh, that's something you could put together, uh, you know, not costing a lot of money to do if you're interested as an event at a farmer's market. That's another key thing with the farmer's market. Uh, we try to do a lot of events there. Uh, we actually have music. Um, I was able, I have a good friend of mine, I'm a musician too, uh, from Florida came up, uh, he's called the Sauce Boss, and he does gumbo, and we did an event called uh, Free Gumbo with White Corn in it, so, and then he plays the blues, and that got people into the market, and so we try to be creative and innovative and in getting people engaged and talk about our traditional foods. Uh, this is the Indigenous Food Challenge, we've been doing this for four years. And basically, I don't know if you've ever seen that TV show on the, the Food Network called Chopped. So what, this is kind of our native version of Chopped. I don't like to say Chopped, it's very negative. So what we do is we actually have a basket of mystery ingredients. Uh, it's all indigenous ingredients and they open it up and then they have an hour to make an entree. We do it with community members as partners. And uh, I actually have professional chefs come down and judge it. Uh, it's really exciting. We do it during our fall festival. It's an outdoor event. Um, so we have a sound system. I actually rent uh, a stove, a grill, and they all work together and uh, create these unbelievable community members come up with these items. Now, these are some of the uh, mystery ingredients that I've used, uh, all indigenous vegetables. Uh, some of the proteins I've used are elk, bison, venison, trout, uh, and rabbit. Um, and of course, we always make uh, white corn uh, the centerpiece of uh, some of the food items. Um, they present it, they're judged on uh, nutrition, on uh, using all the items, just like the show uh, Chopped. So this has been kind of exciting, and uh, the next one we're thinking about is called the Chef's Challenge. So I'd like to get uh, indigenous chefs doing uh, indigenous foods. That's something I'm thinking about this year, so uh, maybe we'll get together on that. Or if you'd like to do that with your community, I'm always happy to share this information with everybody. Uh, physical activity is important. We thought about this. We actually sponsor two races. Uh, we sponsored them in the past. Uh, we do an Earth Day run, and then we do a fall festival run. And uh, not only do we engage local community members, but we uh, go on the uh, internet and we get runners from all over Western New York. Um, it's competitive. I was able, for a fee of $300, get my race certified in New York State. So now it becomes these times are certified in New York State. We're getting competitive runners that uh, would come down. Uh, we run a canning event in our community. I think canning preservation is an important aspect of, of food. Uh, we are fortunate, again, to work with the local Amish community. They designed that box there, which actually we are able to do 128 jars at a time uh, through a propane tank. So uh, that's our community event, and it's a big social gathering. People drop in and bring soup, bring food during the day. Some people like to just peel. Um, when I did the canning, I kind of did all the different stations because I wanted to learn um, I don't have statistics for the last two years, but uh, in 2014, we did 3,200 quarts, and all that went back to the community. If you participated, you went home with a case of product. We just asked that you bring the jars back. So that's been very successful, too. I want to talk about the native plants, which is uh, kind of my area of expertise. Um, I feel that uh, what the Senecas have done is the foundation for all of us when we talk about our medicine plants and our traditional plants that uh, the Senecas became the first U.S. tribe to uh, develop a policy that we, we only plant native Seneca plants and Western New York indigenous plants in our public spaces. We no longer plant European, Asian, or introduced landscape plants. And again, this is the foundation, the building block for you to develop your food sovereignty. Because we lived off the land, we need to think about those original plant species. So we went in, I gave a little boot camp to the Department of Public Works, we removed all the European plants. We tossed them out and we planted all North American, Western New York indigenous species. These plants, these plants, whenever I talk about native plants, it's all of us. They're important to our culture, they're our medicines, our foods, our dye plants, our ceremonial plants. We need to think of the bigger picture. And uh, in our particular building, this is our administration building, we did uh, 448 uh, uh, pieces of plants, 25 different species. So there's a lot of diversity there in the planting. And the first year was amazing, the birds and the wildlife that we got around that building because of the diversity of plant material. 
Also, what you're seeing here is we created a no planting list. So when a contractor comes on territory, we give them this uh, eight page, I think it's eight or 10 pages. You can't plant these here. No more, no more Norway maples. You know, where do you think a Norway maple belongs? In Norway, no. I say that because uh, when I first arrived at uh, Seneca Nation at the community center, um, they actually had 31 Norway maples planted and they have a maple program and we can't tap a Norway maple. And that bothered me. So we worked with the director there and we actually started removing the Norway maples and replacing them with sugar maples, knowing that that's gonna be part of that program probably 10, 15 years down the road. So uh, just like the original slide with the uh, uh, elder circle, you know, everything that we do now, the Iroquois philosophy is everything that we do now affects the next seven generations. So it's critical that we take that, remove those trees and put those Norway, Norway maples back. Uh, we worked with USET, United Southeastern Tribes. They did uh, uh, individual interviews. They also did uh, group interviews. And uh, it's very hard to get metrics on, are we having impact? But we are changing behavior. We are changing the way people think about what they eat and their food choices. Certainly changed me. I can't go down the cafeteria and order a burger now because I could hear people behind me like, there's Mr. Food is our medicine, getting a burger. So I'm a, I'm a confirmed closet chicken wing eater now. So uh, I'm working on it and I'm getting a lot better. But uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to, and I didn't mention here that we tried to implement and we just haven't been successful is uh, the vending machines. And um, there's a lot of resistance even within the health department. Um, I think the best way probably is I've seen a program from Australia where it's called red light, eat, uh, red light, green light, eat right. And basically they're not changing the product, but they're labeling them like a traffic sign, meaning the red could be on the, the candy bar, you know, yellow is in between, a green could be something healthy, like uh, if there were apples or celery sticks in there. So a lot of the vending machines are refrigerated. So that's something I think we need to work on one step at a time you know, one thing, just so people, you're engaging, they're thinking about it, you're not telling them you can't eat it, but you're engaging their thought process and they're questioning it. So I think that's how I would do it. So again, um, we are changing our heating, eating habits there. And uh, I think I got a couple other slides here. We've done an awful lot in four years. Um, the idea here is not only to restore, preserve, maintain our culture, our plants, but we're doing this for the gardeners of the future. Uh, we need to think about our kids and get them involved and families. Uh, we are working to build a healthier Seneca nation. I think we're all trying to build a healthier native nation and uh, if we all work together. Um, I want to take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge uh, a very close friend of mine and uh, I call super volunteer, uh, Marlene Wakefield, if you could please stand. Uh, Marlene is a, um, also a board member for the Seneca Diabetes Foundation. There she is. Not all of us could be here, but Marlene's here. And she's uh, been here at the get-go and, and uh, helping to make this, uh, this uh, project successful. 